This is the Politically Non-Binary Podcast, and I'm your host, Ariel Isaac Norman. Every week, I have on a comedian or some other concerned citizen to confess a controversial opinion or two. Enjoy. So you said you're drinking t- coffee 24-7, but I assume <laughs> that's a slight uh, exaggeration. Yeah, I'm just, just been a, a week, tough week. So. When you have a long week, then that means the... What, how does that go for you? Because like I would think you have a long week, so instead you wake up on Saturday, Sunday morning, and you go, ah, let me luxuriate, not drink any caffeine for a while, maybe get up and have some tea. No, I'm a, I'm a junkie, so I, yeah. I drink coffee all the time. But the problem is, is when you have a rough week, and then you know if you're going out on Friday and Saturday night, and then the oh, weekends yeah. are rough, and then you don't get recovery, and then. Oh, okay. So what did you do last night? Uh, I didn't do too much last night, actually. Um, yesterday was was relatively low key, but uh, yeah, I went out Friday, and it was just a tough week. So usually my weekends are pretty busy, but this was I wasn't feeling very good yesterday. So I oh okay, there was a big party I didn't go to. Oh, you skipped a party? I did, I did. Well, what happened Friday night? Um, I just went. I, I was out. I worked late, and then I was out just at like a meet and greet with some people, and oh, okay. there was a little. There was a drink involved. There's and, a uh, drink or two. Yeah, yeah. I see. Okay. It was not that gluttonous of a week, so that's probably why I'm tired. I'm used to going. Uh, your you know, your body's in rest and, mode. Yeah, now. My, yeah. My body's not used to it. So. Except your body can't be in rest mode because you keep fucking up your adrenal glands with yeah. all this coffee. Well, no, I don't think it has that much effect on me. I also have. I had an injury in my neck, and I have these two friends of mine that have been working on me. He's a chiropractor, and uh, they own a massage therapy. And they were doing that. I think the toxin release really uh, gave me a dump too, because yeah. um, what they did was amazing. But uh, yeah, it was like I think. But then you some, need to be drinking lots of water and I, not coffee. I, I do drink a lot of water. Okay, I do. I'm just I am <laughs> I accidentally drank coffee this morning because I've switched to tea. Like finally, after many years of kind of going back and forth about should I should I, whatever, I've, I've successfully switched to tea. But this morning, I finally went to the coffee shop by my new place, um, and I was all excited about. I'm like, because I usually I would just drink an americano with a pastry, like that's my thing. Um, but then I was like, oh, they had it was the last day of their pumpkin spice no, thing yeah, that's yeah, made with vegan. I don't even, you know what I mean? Like I like I to know. be seasonal. It's a cute thing to do, but it. But then I forgot to say decaf, which I didn't realize until halfway through it, and by then I was like. Oh well. Uh, well, we'll just. <laughs> I can drink coffee in bed yeah. and fall asleep with like a mug in my hand. It's just you know, no, like, yeah, it's not good for me. But well, but I don't know. It is. I don't know what it would be like to for have to have caffeine not be that effective to you because like some people are just like that. Like the other day, a comic offered me. He for some reason got two cocktails. I don't know why. Like the same one, and he was like, "Oh, do you want one?" And like usually, I don't really drink that much, especially at comedy shows. Um, but there was a part of me that was like, oh, I'm, you know, I might just try. I just like trying things. I'm like, I might just try it. And then I was like, well, which one is it? And then I just read the ingredients. And like one of the ingredients was like an energy drink. And I'm like, oh. you have to warn someone. This also happened to me. I call it the reverse Cosby because this <laughs> this, <laughs> this guy brought me a cocktail. when He was bringing everyone cocktails and I didn't ask for one, but it's because I was like performing and he didn't just have the opportunity to ask. And so he just was like, oh, I got you one too. And I took a sip and I was like, what is this? And it was like a lavender blueberry espresso martini. And I'm like, you can't, you can't at nine o'clock at night give right. someone like, just cause it doesn't affect you. It, like it, I won't be, if I drink two sips of this, I won't be able to sleep for 12 hours. Yep. That's I, when I was in my probably teenage years, I, um, so just a few years ago, uh-huh. um, I, I, somebody was smoking a bowl and I guess it had hair, they laced it with heroin and didn't mm. tell anybody. Yeah. Same, same thing. I was like, okay, apparently I smoked heroin one time in my life. I had right. no, you know. Yeah. I mean, everyone knows, like, I mean, some people still do it because they're jerks, but like, you know, you're not supposed to lace, you, you know, offer someone one drug mm-hmm. that has some other drug in it. But with, but with coffee, it's like some people don't seem to think that that's a problem. No, I know. Like I say, for me, it's not a big deal, but right. I know. Right. There are people that if, you know, they drink a sip after 6 p.m., they're not sleeping right. that night. And people need to realize, I mean, and, and especially it's like, yeah, some people are more sensitive to caffeine and some not. And that one, I don't think is as much of a sex based thing, but it is that thing of like, you need to understand that some people are different from you. Mm-hmm. Like, I remember one time, you know, at a comedy show um, where yeah, we all got, I think, I think we all got like 
two or three drink tickets or something at a it was a brewery yeah, right, so that's right. like one of their um and we were all kind of deciding like ooh what beers do we want to try and stuff I think maybe we got two drink tickets and he and so this guy was like oh you got to get the triple blah 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 he has, you know best bang for it you get so much out and I'm like okay sir <laughs> <laughs> you know and this is a guy who's you know twice my size and it's I mean, at least twice my size you know and I'm just like okay if you drink two triples you'll be strongly opinionated. <laughs> if I drink two of those, I'll be date rapeable. Yeah. So that's, we have a different, you have to consider like, the other person's. This is a guy who probably puts down a 20, a case just to like lube up for the evening, right. you know? <laughs> right. Because that same thing. Most of my friends are alcoholics and I'm pretty much a lightweight when it comes to drugs and alcohol. Yeah. I'm a cheap date. Cheap, yeah. Yeah, so unfortunately except for coffee you got coffee yeah that's right it. that's right coffee i am uh, you gotta boof it if you want it to <laughs> hit at all. never tried that but you know maybe well they have coffee enemas too uh, i don't even know if that's insane. yeah mm. but does that give you the caffeine or is that i guess i don't really it's, uh, yeah some do you get a cleanse. big high from you want me to do a handstand and give well, it a shot right now <laughs> <laughs> just report back <laughs> i used to work at the paleo butter coffee shop here in town back when it was just one trailer now there i saw them there in houston which don't shop there the woman who owns it sucks um but uh even though the, some of the products are good but um yeah there was like people were always advocating like really strongly mm -hmm. like you have to like people evangelize about coffee enemas i and i hate that like Politics, religion, life, anybody who tries to push their crap. And again, lifestyle stuff, yeah. they do it all the time. You know, my way is the right way kind of mentality. Well, people do it with vices life. a lot, too. Yeah. Not just, you know, things that they think, you know, like Jesus saved me or whatever. But like people will do it with vices, I think, largely because if everybody else is doing them, then they don't feel mm -hmm. bad about it. You know, it's like that thing when your whole family drinks a lot and then you say, Oh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't really drink. And they're like, well, you're not even going to have, you know, come no. on. When it's like, what do you think you're better than us? That kind that's, of thing. That's yeah. the world we live in is yeah. everybody has to justify their own thoughts, opinions, right. and lifestyle by recruiting everybody. And I just wish people would realize like we're all <laughs> so different from like as, as similar as we all are and whatever. There's so many differences and you never really know which ways other people are yeah. different from you. And so like, people you over universalize their own experiences. And it's like, Maybe you should drink and maybe you should be an atheist and maybe you should. But like that doesn't mean that it's, the other person also should. I am totally happy. Everybody express your opinion, thoughts. I will have a debate. Just don't try to recruit me because I don't yeah. care what I can be 100 percent believer in whatever it is you're talking about. And I'll take the other side just to be, you know, yeah. just to be controversial with. Well, I don't. But, but then again, I mean, I think sometimes there are times I think when it can be good to try to persuade people to a different point of view, but maybe it depends on this, like the spirit of how you do it. Look, look at politics yeah. nowadays. I mean, everybody's pretty much set in their ways, right? Like, like, like not on certain topics, but yeah. overall, you know, you got the liberals, you got the conservatives. Those two people are never going to convince anybody of anything, but they're both trying heavily to recruit the other side. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, that's part of the problem is like, let's, you know, everyone needs to stop identifying so much right. with these labels. Oh, yeah. Whichever label categories we're talking about, most of them are a little bit, you know, just too rigid. And so it's weird because most people aren't 100 percent anything. And so if you're going like this is my team and this is what we believe, like, I don't think you really yeah. like some of that stuff could be persuaded around if people aren't so attached to the identity. You know, I mean, I think I, I and maybe I'm just someone who like I really am pretty susceptible <laughs> to arguments, you know, like I really. But that means that you're kind of. On the fence somewhere, usually. Yeah, well, and, I just, I, and again, I look at it, especially with the lifestyle stuff, is that I know people constantly just trying to recruit everybody. And I'm like, if you are not a hundred percent, just it's not calling you. Yeah. Then tread lightly because psychologically, yeah. you know, the therapy is going to cost a lot of money down the line. If yeah. You, if this you goes bad. You misstep in in a lot of things in life, but. You know, I'm trying to think of something that it, it can be good, like to try to persuade someone of. Oh, like I've tried to persuade a lot of people to stop um, consuming fake sugars. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's something like it's, it's not everything is like once if it's not political, it's easier because no. it's not tied to identity. I mean, some people do really consider themselves a Diet Coke drinker. <laughs> That's that um, is kind of an I, identity. I but them. well, uh, <laughs> can, can I take a moment to convince you not to drink them? I No, I doubt it. I <laughs> mean, too, <laughs> honestly, too it's one of those things. I don't drink. I drink water and coffee so often that the only time I really put flavor in my body is like a Coke Zero. Coke Zero. And How often do you drink them? 
I mean, I'll, like at dinner, I'll have one, two, mm-hmm. you know, on a bad day, three. But it's not like I'm, you know, but it's the only flavor that I put in. And yeah, but I've been trying to convince people to join my cult yeah. for decades. Yeah, I just haven't found anybody that's that susceptible. But since is you say anyone? you're so susceptible, <laughs> wait, to is, it, is it just a cult of one so far? I, don't, I haven't figured out the concept yet. I just want to be a cult leader. I don't, you know, I don't yeah. know what it is. I joked It'll around. It'll be a sexual cult. Don't get me wrong. I, mean, <laughs> I fucked around and started a cult once, but it <laughs> it was all fine until someone in my cult started dating someone who's in an actual tiny cult. Oh. And that everything got, uh, that's a long story. But anyway, what is your, <laughs> what's your controversial opinion? Um, so we were talking, I like to say uh, um, uh, the Me Too movement has no place in like BDSM and, and lifestyle stuff, um, which uh, I, I like to start off that. I like to start there. To, to Me- really get okay. the, the debate going. Right. And I think, so what you're saying is, like the rules that people have tried to come up with in the era of reflecting on abuses of sexual dynamics um, don't necessarily apply in BDSM situations. Yeah, I think they're they're trying to apply them. And mm-hmm. and don't get me wrong, I am a hundred percent behind Me Too movement. I think guys who look like me, middle aged and old white guys, you know, we should be walking on eggshells. We've we've made some done a few abusive abuses in our lifetime. Just um, for thousands of years. Just, just you know, <laughs> I mean, okay, I'm, I can only be responsible for me. <laughs> yeah. uh, but the I've been around for like 19 years in different lifestyles, swinging, BDSM, polyamory. Um, so I've seen the change, the change that social media and internet and, and those things were around, but they weren't that, that big, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and the energy is just kind of leaving all of these things because... It's become this popular thing. So you get the Me Too movement comes out and now all the, and for lack of a better term, cancel culture kind of stuff that's working its way into these lifestyles and especially BDSM. Um, they, BDSM was very self-policed. Mm-hmm. It is all about negotiation, right. all about Consent, all about the consent is prearranged right. before uh, right. some kind of event or scene. But nowadays, the BDSM world, and again, this is not, uh, I'm not the the rule, but it's a lot about performative stuff, and it's not as much about psychological stuff. And and the hmm. gist of BDSM is really all the physical stuff that's done is really to elicit a psychological response. Okay. But because of this, like uh, trying to apply the kind of Me Too culture to it when both male and female are dominant and submissive it it doesn't make sense right there to some extent but you can't do a lot of the psychological stuff because you haven't negotiated every little thing so so you you don't want as the sub to have to be giving enthusiastic consent throughout the whole thing (laughs) exactly or me planning everything you know if we're gonna play and i gotta you know, I got everything, by, everything you. by you. There's no surprises. There's no fear play. There's no kind of psychological response I'm going to get if you're already prepared for everything. everything. So, yeah. we, you know, you come up with parameters, you negotiate certain things. Yeah. And, but you kind of got to mind fuck them a little bit. Yeah. Um, within reason. Well, yeah. don't you? I mean, because to the extent that I've, you know, gotten into these kind of things, you can tell the Dom, um, Hey, you heard my hard nose and then like, but anything else is a good until I say red light or right. whatever. Right. Um, you can also do a thing like I, I've seen some real Virgo energy from a dom who like made his whole spreadsheet of like every possible sexual act you could, she could think of. And then you have the person go totally no, a little interested kind of interest, mm-hmm. you know, pretty interested or definitely yeah, or that kind of thing yeah. and like go through all of that. And so then the Dom can like look through that. So, so now if there's, you know, 200 things on that, then in any given day or scene, like the, the sub right. isn't going to know which things you might do, but this person has a really good idea now of the things that are not <laughs> only off limits, but kind of like where we're at. And, and that's fine. And, mm-hmm. you know, usually like uh, for me, cause I'm a dominant. So the submissive would well, a lot of them have those lists and you can go through that and they're pretty, pretty detailed, but, um, it doesn't talk about 
All right. So for example, I'm negotiating with somebody and a lot of times this is how it goes. It's like, okay, I'm going to take my clothes off and give you my body for an hour and tie me. I'm more well known for rope. So a lot yeah. of times rope is involved, um, as well as other things. And you could tie me up and you can go down on me. You know, you can finger me, you can stick your dick in my mouth. You can touch me here. You can do this. You can beat me. You can leave marks on me here, 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 but you know, nothing in my ass. Don't go in my ass. So for me, I want to get into that fear place. So a lot of it is about the submissive, you know, being vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. And and getting into that vulnerable space and taking them close to that line mm -hmm. of consent violation, but right. not going over it, right? So there's there's the walk that we have to do. Yeah. But so they say, okay, nothing in the ass. So what I'm going to do is or what I used to do, and I probably yeah. couldn't get away with this anymore. I can with my partners and, yeah. and people I know, but if it's more somebody that's new, um, I might take lube out <laughs> right. when they're bent over and lube up their ass and then grab a dildo uh -huh. and kind of go tease like tease, whatever. right? Yeah. And that's fear play, that's psychological. I'm getting in their head, I'm doing right. things like that. You can't do any of that kind of stuff anymore without you know, kind of getting a bad reputation. Interesting. And so I won't, I don't do any kind of pickup play anymore. I don't do any of that stuff anymore. Yeah. I, I pretty much just, you know, play with people. Well, I, know I mean, and, maybe that is a better, maybe that kind of stuff is better with, with people that you're pretty comfortable with and close in. It, yeah. it is. But the problem is, is I have a very good reputation. I am very trustworthy. I've never had anybody accuse me of any consent violation. Yeah. So my partners trust the hell out of me. So yeah. <laughs> the, I can't really, I, I, to get fear play out of them, if that's what they're into, mm -hmm. I have to do stuff with like fire and stuff that could go wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, doing things that no matter how good you are at it could potentially be disastrous. Yeah, you want some actual danger in there to yeah. really get the peak right. experience. And that's that becomes the problem where, uh, but yeah, if you, you know, I was talking to somebody one time and I said, uh, you know, I used to do these scenes where I would, you know, I'm going to play with somebody, we negotiate, and I'm going to tie them up and do some impact play on them. And, you know, you can bruise me here, here, here. So I would tie them up, but they, you know, don't draw any blood. Don't mm -hmm. do things like this. I would tie them up and then I would open up my toy bag and I'd bring out, you know, you can bring out like a bat with barbed wire on it or mm -hmm. things that are obviously going to draw blood, yeah. right? And you lay them out like you're going to use them, but right. you're not going to actually use them. Right. And, you know, a friend of mine, um, and she runs kind of one of the educational groups, she we got in a big debate because she's like, you can't do that anymore. And I'm like, BDSM is, again, it's, it's a psychological, psychological thing. Yeah. You know, swinging is a very physical thing and BDSM yeah. is very psychological. And, you know, she was like, you can't do that anymore. I'm like, this is why the community is kind of falling apart because right. there's th the energy has left it. Everybody that is coming into it now has learned from performers. Yeah. I am used to be a performer a lot. So I'm part of the problem. And I got caught up in the popularity of being a performer too. And the performer, too. can you explain what that means? So I did, I, well, performing can be two things. Like at a party, if you're doing a scene in front of 30 people, 50 people, yeah. you're performing. But I also have done big performances. Like actually at Ironworks, I do a big thing here. And I used to do these performances in front of 300 people that were vanilla people. They were psychiatrists and psychologists. That oh, that's was, funny. <laughs> it was great because they would come to, <clears throat> they, they'd come for a conference. And what it was, was a conference, and it's the Sexual Health Alliance, I'll give them a plug. They used to do a, uh, where they bring in like psychologists and psychiatrists, they do a conference teaching them about lifestyle, teaching them about people that are in swinging BDSM, polyamory, uh, to educate them how to talk to their clients. Mm -hmm. And then they would do like a masquerade ball, a big party right down the street here. Oh, that's cool. And like three, 400 people would show up and then they would have all these performers come. So I would come and do like suspensions and fire play and stuff and like mm -hmm. the middle of, and these people just wide eyed because they're, <laughs> it yeah. was like- This is I, what our clients do. I, yeah, yeah, I fed off the energy similar like when you got an audience in your hands, yeah. right? And you're feeding off them. I was like, this is so cool because yeah. I'm just looking at doe eyes everywhere going, yeah. there's this guy doing things to this naked girl and suspending her and then lighting her on fire. <laughs> and it yeah. was just crazy. Um, so I did a few of those, uh, and that was pre COVID, but. Okay. So performing, yeah. that means like, so now that if, if you're now, because people are becoming more performative with it, you're saying that that has led to a culture of people being less interested in the real intense psychological scenes in private. Yes. I, and, and 
I think like, again, rope's the big thing now. There's a whole rope community, which is problematic in itself because rope should be a tool that's used to create energy or some sort of dynamic between the top and bottom. Mm -hmm. But it's just become performative and become artistic. Very aesthetic. Yeah, and yeah. I and I love the performative aspect of it. Yeah. I love the artistic aspect of it. I, yeah. I thrive on that stuff as well. Mm -hmm. But I've done classes with some of these people where I talk about like enhanced dynamics between the top and bottom and psychological tools to kind of get the, the bottom or the sub deeper into that's the scene. Yeah. And they're just, same thing, they're just, blown away by this concept because with social media you know most people are learning to tie up to do it in front of a crowd yeah. to do it put it on their instagram accounts right. right you know the only time they ever tie somebody up privately is practice for those kind of things yeah so and again it's it's beautiful it, it's artistic it's creative and those are great things but it's not kink it's not bdsm to me yeah exactly it is just like an aesthetic thing yeah that's something I like because so many women for a while when I was like on the dating apps, it was just like Shibari, 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 mm -hmm. Shibari. And I think yeah, it didn't seem as much about the psychological no. dynamic, you know. And even within the community. I just it's, think it's so pretty. Like Yeah, I want to be, you know, made that pretty. And again, yeah. that's a wonderful aspect of it. I'm not knocking that aspect. But it's like of everything's it, missing, for the gram now. It's yeah. kind of what you're Yeah, and that makes sense. The deeper the deeper connection that you can have and, the, right. and the energy that you can feed off of each other between two right. people. Like, I don't like abusing women. I don't like hitting women. Right. I like the response. I like right. what it gives them psychologically. I like that their body's a canvas and, you know, I can bite their ass and leave my teeth marks. And for the next five days, every time, you know, their yeah. ass is warm and they can feel that bruise and they're going to think of me. I'm, you know, yeah. it gives me a little bit of, um, you know, yeah, a little a thrill. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and it's, for me, like, with with sexual kink stuff, like, I really like having, like, a storyline or, like, a real psychological dynamic going on um, of what the power exchange is and why and what's going on with that. And, like, so that's just not at all what's going to be happening if you're doing it mm -hmm. performatively. And that's one of the classes that I did was, I just called it, I think, in enhanced dynamics, mm -hmm. you know, between uh, top and bottom. Um, and again, it's just basic psychology 101 stuff, you know, how you talk to somebody, where you're positioned, you know, to, to put them deeper into a subspace or, or into a more vulnerable situation. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> and people in the community that have only been in it for five years are just, it, these thoughts never cross their mind, you know, and somebody like me who's been in it. And when I started doing rope, um, it was becoming popular, but there was only a handful of people that were, you know, pretty good at it and trustworthy. Now everybody's into it. But again, it's become we're going to do a rope scene. Yeah. Well, it's become the, the top is seening with the rope. The bottom is seening with the rope. But again, it's a barrier. And it's it's just like, OK, this is my canvas and this is my paint. And I'm the top who's going to paint this picture. But there should be a lot more to it, in my opinion. OK, so <laughs> I see what you're saying about. Um, the Me Too kind of stuff getting in the way of wanting to tease people with violating their actual consent. Right. Um, and 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 it's an interesting thing because I think even beyond teasing about actual you know violation of consent, which is people who are into consensual non consent. No, probably are into that's the, a whole different right uh, that's no different, but that's but. what it, you know like <clears throat> that's if, if you're into the idea of being taken right. advantage of and all that kind of stuff um in a consensual way then you probably would be really turned on by the the toying right. with the line of violating the actual consent um and then sometimes there is a dynamic of like people don't really know what they want or the thing that they're most afraid of might be something that does give them the most catharsis or release right. or, you know, exhilaration or whatever. Um, and so, but to me, again, that's something like, like if you really wanted, if you were actually going to get to the, the, a deep level between people where you really could violate what they said their consent was, um, all the while them having the ability to say right. red or pineapple or whatever, um, then that's something that probably really only should happen between people who really know and trust each other. And if I'm playing with somebody new, I mean, I'm, I've always been paranoid. I'm always going to do a baseline. 
Yeah. But again, doing a little bit of mind fuck in there is yeah. going to really get them a little bit more of that cathartic release. Do you think that's <clears throat> also part of the whole like, kind of like triggered um, complaining culture where it's, you know, because I, I just notice a lot of times when people say they're triggered, they just mean they're upset, you mm -hmm. know, and it's like, yeah, but upset is physiological arousal, which can be interpreted by your mind in different ways. And so like. But people seem to be a lot of people like the younger, especially seem to be really averse to feeling a lot, yeah. feeling upset. Um, and and that's but part of part of BDSM is all about feeling upset. And then the release from that. The therapy, because so many people that have sort of abuse or, or some other sort of traumas in yeah. their past use it as right. that as therapy right like to to bring them close to that point but have somebody they trust to not go past that point right actually is very therapeutic to them because it empowers right. them and they're kind of taking the power back from right exactly a, whatever traumatic issue it is yeah either whatever kind of abuse it was um you can take the power back and you can also have it happen now in like a loving context mm -hmm. and things um but so i could see i think it's it is one of these things where just like we're all kind of roll our eyes at the at the the Gen Z or younger millennials who, um, you know, think that they want safe spaces all the time and and complain about being triggered by this that or the other or say they have PTSD even though nothing bad has ever ever really happened to them. Um, well, we all have PTSD uh, for something. Sure. We're mean, all triggered by something. But we but can it's be kind of like saying we all have OCD. Too. It's like right. we do. We are we're all on the spectrum of how <clears throat> traumatized we are about all kinds of things. But it's like. But it, there's a clinical definition, right. and and then people use narcissism and OCD and and PTSD and everything. Believe me, I have kids, in a way that, and it's like, yeah, you know, they self-diagnose themselves, right. and they wear it as such a badge on their sleeve. And I'm like, that's it's everybody. Crazy you know, it's called teen angst, right? We've all right. been there. And don't get me wrong, there's there's some real traumas that you have mm -hmm. to really kind of address, but it's it's not this major. Kind of and people life altering maybe event. at some point need to learn it's okay to be upset and go through yeah. that. And so for some people, if they have lived a life where they have avoided upset at all costs, and that's what the way they've asked the world to do for them and their parents provided and whatever, then like, yeah, maybe sex isn't the only or the best time to get through it. But at some point, it's just part of a larger problem of like, no, it's it's it can really be a good thing to go through being upset and in a safe, you trauma know, in a, yeah. and is character building to some extent, trauma is, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> Thanks for better memoirs. <laughs> it, it may, yeah. You know, we're, we didn't all get to where we are by living yeah. this perfect ideal life. David and then, Sedaris's father was a real piece of work. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, oh boy, we can deep dive here. Well, of course, one of his sisters has killed herself, but she had a lot going on. And you know what? It takes... <laughs> Takes one of those to get a David and an Amy. Well, that's, <laughs> okay, I'll stop. Again, living through my kids and their their uh, all their traumas, and and they're they've had some real traumas and things. But I also, you know, my generation, we couldn't wear that stuff on our sleeve, right? We had to, and and I think you learn to cope with things a lot better in a, in a way to where nowadays it's such a badge of honor, and you know they all kind of diagnose themselves and they all have all these issues and all these issues. And I'm, eh, we, we all have all these issues and yeah. finding a way to deal with it. Again, yeah. for me, a lot of that is lifestyle stuff because to me, that's all escapism, right? Yeah. It's, I mean, there's a part of me that needs that. And there's a part of me and I, I haven't really explored why, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I, I do know it's cathartic and therapeutic for me because I know, I get a high off of it. I can mm -hmm. go in and do something and, you know, you live off of that in your mm -hmm. brain and you, you know, you're having a shitty day at work and it's you know, you <laughs> rest in that back, area. Go back to that gangbang a couple weeks yeah. ago. That, that that was awesome, man. <laughs> Life's <laughs> worth living. Um, yeah. Okay. So, well, so that's one aspect I could see. I could see what, what you're saying about um, Me Too kind of cramping BDSM style. But, you know, a lot of what the Me Too movement was about was trying to get particularly men, but people in power to recognize dynamics that are going on with the the boundary is that the grayness of consent when um when someone who has power over you is wanting something sexual from you and you don't and you're not thinking about that dynamic and realizing how she, her consent might be really uh, tilted towards something because she's worried about losing her job or not getting promoted, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that's 
absolutely perfect for the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. But when you're putting yourself in a place, male or female as a submissive, mm -hmm. to give somebody power for an hour, a, a day, 24 seven, lifetime, yeah. 365, whatever it is, part of what you're trying to get is to give up that power, yeah. you know? And like my ex, um, a lot of the real crazy stuff that we did, mm -hmm. you know, she, she would say, tie me up and then, you know, let these other guys and girls at me, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of things. Because she was giving up the power to me. So yeah. she could put that responsibility on me and it didn't mess with her guilt as, as much, right? Yeah. Because she still had that, you know, you're brought up with religion. Yeah, religious and, stuff. And, and, yeah, yeah. It's not my fault if yeah. I'm being raped. Exactly. Yeah. So, and there's a lot of that that happens is yeah. people, you know, they want to be put on display. They want to be put into that submissive role. They want to yeah. be put into their, to where they're giving up the power. That's part of it. It's, you know, and. For me, I, I can associate it, I say, like a massage. Like you go in yeah. for like a real relaxing massage, the music's going, the candles going, the lights are right, mm -hmm. and you lose yourself in that. And time flies by, and I couldn't tell you how many times I've played with somebody for like an hour and a half, and they'll be like, That was 20 minutes. Wait, you're done? Yeah. You're only going to do 15 minutes? I'm like, Yeah, yeah we're, we're done. We got to get out of here. There's like people <laughs> waiting to use this apparatus, and, uh, yeah. you know, we've been way over our time limit. So, it, that's why I say the Me Too movement in society and work yeah. and in but in BDSM, you're literally it's a power dynamic that, that you're, you're going for. Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of cases where people are like, oh, I didn't want to enter a BDSM relationship with this guy, but he, you know, was ahead of me in, in our career paths. And so I ha <laughs> like I just don't. I'm yeah. not moving up in the BDSM world or, by letting this yeah, guy do stuff know, I didn't really want. Cane my ass. Right. You know, it's, right. So I'm trying to think like, is you know, what else? What else are people even applying from the Me Too movement toward BDSM? I, I just think it's the it's just a, a mentality and it, fairness. Mm -hmm. You know, men who look like me <laughs> have been horrible in society. Um, but in that world, it, it's you can't take everything from social, your social life and the world and how everything's going and apply it towards that and then get a, the result that you want. Mm -hmm. And they are. And that's the, the, I'm saying people are getting, again, lack of a better term, canceled. canceled. So, yeah, like tell me, give me an example of who's gotten canceled for what. Um, so there are plenty of websites that are out there that are lifestyle orientated. Yeah. And they're kind of like Facebook for, you know, like Fet Life. Like Fet Life. Is, is, right? is, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, somebody can do something and somebody's going to report you. They're going to put a post up there. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you can't go to groups and parties. And well, so like, yeah, what's an example of somebody who like what what has someone done? Um, I know of one guy who was dating a girl, mm -hmm. um, tied her up. And uh, the, the anal thing is actually why I brought that up is because uh -huh. he tied her up and he was fucking her from behind and he had his thumb right by her ass. Yeah. And he says she was kind of backing into it uh -huh. and he just kind of let her, you know, kind yeah. of ride the. And um, yeah, he's not allowed to go to parties and stuff. Certain certain groups have banned him because she said this. I'm like, okay. She said that was not, and that was a hard limit for her that they had negotiated. Yeah, yeah. and she said he thumb, put her, his thumb in her ass and she was tied up. So it's a BDSM thing. But I'm like going, this is kind of a relationship thing, really. Like, yeah, you mm -hmm. were tied up and, and, but this was private in your bedroom between, I don't know if how, uh, how they were dating. I don't know how long, I yeah. don't know any of that. But yeah, it, it to me, I was like, that's not even a community thing. That it's it's bad. Yeah, depending on who's right and who's wrong. Well, who's I think they're both right and both wrong because I mean, both right at least because there it is hard to know sometimes. Especially men are not as good at um, nonverbal communication, mm -hmm. like and as understanding it. I've I've heard of studies anyway where men are not picking up as much nonverbal communication as women are, and 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 women Absolutely. think they're putting out more and everything. And so I could see her going, I was making it clear that I was trying to scooch your thumb away. And he right. was going, oh, she's trying to get into yeah. my... <laughs> so, you know, like, I think that could just be a miscommunication. And then if her thing was just, hey, like, I, I told you I didn't want that. Right. And you did it anyway. But it was just this much of his thumb. 
or something. Well, well what's too much? You know, well, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's a man's thumb, too. I'm thinking about a woman's thumb, but you have a good yeah. male yeah, thumb. Yeah, you want those? Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm, but it depends on how much of the thumb, you know, like. I'm told I would make a good lesbian. Right? <laughs> and at what point did she, but at what point did she um, say no? Like, it's, did she. And that was the other thing is it was after. and Because I think, yeah, they're good safe words, right? But, so it's like. But again, what? this was really just a couple. Right, this is a couple, and I don't. I said she. You go. You use the safe word. Although I've also have women before who like didn't know that I had a finger in their ass mm -hmm. or something. You know, they weren't sure what was going on because you got enough fingers everywhere, and they're just kind of full. And they're and yeah. I was like, no. I was in your and if you're relaxed, it it it's, things feel good, and yeah. you kind of you kind of lean into it, literally. Right. And sometimes when you do when you do have fingers in a woman's butt, it's like she this mixture of pain and pleasure and confusion for mm -hmm. her. She's not even really sure what's so. Yeah, that just seems like something that she should have just safe worded the moment that she realized she didn't right. like it and then said, oh, no, 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 like I was not, and I was not backing into you. That's just a, a fairly I was backing example. into because you were, like, you were also yeah. fucking my pussy. So yeah. like I was backing into that. Right. I'm sorry, my asshole <laughs> is, is connected to my pussy, you know. Like I said, that's there, a there's so a many, there's so many of these kind of stories. And, but nowadays I think it's not even so much what's actually happening that the stories yeah. and examples i think there's so much fear of getting canceled getting banned right. getting blacklisted well that's that how the cancel culture what the, the what the real problem with it is is it, it does become this kind of witch hunts type of thing mm -hmm. because then if one guy can be canceled because a woman he was dating and he had a miscommunication where he thought Oh, she's actually leaning into right. like finally, you know, wanting to try this um, and didn't say word and whatever. Then it's like, yeah, then everyone else is like, oh, shit. Like, yeah. I, I mean, in. there's yeah. there's plenty of examples where people who are in relationships, sometimes long term relationships. Yeah. And then they break up for whatever reason bad blood and then suddenly they're like oh he violated me this whole time because right. he broke my consent he manipulated me into this this but and sometimes, this and that's true in a lot of cases it's, sometimes I'm not it really saying is because but... sometimes you know i was just talking to my girlfriend about an ex of hers and like she tells me these stories and i'm like how the fuck did you keep dating that <laughs> person and 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 she's like well it's just such a distorting world that you're in yeah when you're and it, and and there was some I'm not like sexual as much I think but like verbal and and physical abuse a little bit I mean it was female to female so it's not as crazy but like but so I think I, I am sympathetic to sometimes in relationships you just put up with so much at least women women tend to I mean because women females have a thing where we're, we're like you know people complain when we're pmsing or on our periods or whatever with a part of our cycle where we take things to an 11 but it's like yeah because when things have been in an 8 all the rest of the month we've been at a 4 about them right and so we just kind of <laughs> y'all are just kind it's of 11 like, plus 8 <laughs> yeah and now we're now we're finally saying something about this thing that has been a problem the whole time but we didn't have the testosterone to deal with it until now. And so. And that's, and again, I'm not, there's people that are great at manipulating yeah. other people. Right. Into doing Manipulative stuff. And, I, and, and I see it yeah. all the time. And also there's a, a frenzy aspect. Like when people come into lifestyles, you know, and they see, you know, swinging is great because <laughs> I shouldn't say great. It sounds horrible, but swinging, like people will come into swinging and some girl who's like, everybody's accepting of me. Going out and fucking 20 people, guys, mm -hmm. girls, doesn't matter, right? Like, yeah. like I'm actually more popular because I can leave this party and say, I, I fucked six guys, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And they're like getting patted on their back for it. And then they yeah. go into this frenzy, but then they're kind of manipulating themselves. But then the predators are out there they're, as well. Yeah. And they're going, ooh, that one's in a frenzy. Yeah. I can do whatever I want to that one. And right. I can use that to my advantage, not just for sex, but also there was a case fairly recently where uh, a guy was using this girl who was really good looking and he was using her to recruit other people yeah and kind of same thing like selling their belief structure onto other people and kind of manipulating them into doing things past their comfort level yeah so that's the thing there are still actual you know kind of abuse issues in the bdsm and kink and poly and and swinging world so i think it's just always been my thing with with all the Me Too stuff. It's like we need to be having more nuanced conversations mm -hmm. about this stuff. And sometimes the people who are complaining about something that really was 
a you know an issue between two adults who had safe words and they could have and it was a miscommunication and they could have worked that out themselves Th- that being ma- then made into a public cancellation thing really hurts people who have legitimate mm. things that they need to bring up in 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 the you know it's so weird to just call it me too context in the yeah. sexual politics discussion debate and you know I, I use the me too thing to, well, we to start do, the debate, it's, right? It's, like, yeah, exactly. I, I use it as I use it to be controversial, right. to, to get into the nuance. Well, we got to title the right. episodes things that are controversial to get you <laughs> assholes to watch. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, I, I, uh, uh, and again, I don't play or participate nearly as much in any of these worlds. I'm very social in them now, but I don't play as much like I used to because mm-hmm. of a lot of this. And, you know, you got to like BDSM, it's you feel like you got to have a four hour conversation to play with them for 30 minutes. Right. Yeah. Because you got to make sure you're you're getting all of these aspects done. And in the past, it was kind of all right. You got a good reputation. You know, don't cut off any of my limbs. Don't, you know, pick yeah. anything up my butt. Don't, you know, whatever. Don't make me bleed. And within that context, you know, I can use my words. The problem with safe words and the problems with some things like that, that people will come back at is you're in the moment, you're in your own head, you're deep in subspace, you might not be capable of using safe words. Like if I'm Mm. doing a scene, say, you know, I negotiate with somebody and it's no sex and this happens all the time. You mean no PIV when you say that. Yes, but this happens all the time. Well, they'll be, you know, maybe they'll give you a limit. You can suck on my boobs and touch me down there, but no penetration, don't, no oral. And then you're tying them up and you're biting them and you're doing all these things to them. And then halfway through, they're like, fuck me, fuck me, fuck me. And you're like, Well, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> I really, really want to, but right. but we didn't negotiate that. I mean, well, I, and then sometimes what's hot for someone is wanting something that you can't have, and so then if you do fuck them, it might really kind of ruin it for them. Like, or you know, or they might be like, "Oh, yay! It was so fun to violate that. It was nice to tease and then violate it." But like sometimes it really is like if you have various reasons that might not all might, some of them might be more intellectual than physical um, or long-term than short-term, but you mm-hmm. might have real reasons why you don't want to have, you know, be penetrated. Um, but you still enjoy the dynamic of begging for something yeah. and wanting something and then not getting it. I yeah. mean, that's a, you know, a and huge part of it. No, that's, that's great. And, and that's happens all the time. And that's, yeah. but again, you can't change negotiation midway through because mm-hmm. um, that's when you're definitely going to get canceled. Yeah. But I've had a partner of mine one time and real heavy, heavy masochist. And I'm not a sadist. I'm more of a sensualist, but um, I like reactions. So if they're masochistic and this was a sexual partner of mine mm-hmm. and she she told me, you know, I don't want sex during when you're doing really heavy impact play on me. Yeah. No sex. And I said, all right, so did all the impact, got done. And then she was like, fuck me, fuck me. And I was like, I can't, you said no sex. And she's like, no, I meant during my aftercare is is sex, right? (laughs) I'm like, well, you needed to, you know, verbalize that before we did that. I got that when when she said that. She said during impact, no sex. Well, she said no sex. She kind of made it pretty open-ended. So yeah, so she just said no sex. And I, you know, from my brain was until you come down in probably 24 hours, I am not having sex with you because... You could be in a space where you're not really able exactly. to Exactly. It's like being consent. drunk. Yeah. You can't you can't consent. Right. Uh, you know. If yeah, yeah, it could be one of those things where it's kind of like, you know, tie me up so I can hear the siren song, but don't actually let me yeah. go. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's the kind of thing where it is good to be doing this with partners that you know and that you can talk about that kind of stuff beforehand and go... Because, I mean, I have those conversations all the time. Like, okay, but, or even I had a friend who you didn't want me to let her eat the snickerdoodle cookies in the freezer. And I, she was like, even if I beg, still say, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so it would really become a thing every night where she's like, no, I didn't mean it. No, yeah. let me have two. And I'm like, you, I don't know what to do here. That's, yeah, no, this yeah. girl, uh, the next day she texts me because we, afterwards she's like, what do you mean no? And the next day she texts me, she's like, just so you know. In the future, when we're done, violate the hell out of me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, and that's good. And that's good to you, that you waited. And then, you know, 24 hours later, she can tell you, okay, now in the future. So that's what I would say. It's probably good. Like, I think it's, it, maybe it is okay to swing the pendulum a little bit too far on the side of annoying consent. Um, you know, for now, since it has been thousands of years of abuse. And then 
you know, but hopefully we can all then start to add a little bit more nuance to the conversation. Man, that's what we're doing, trying to do right now. That's what I, exactly. That's my point is to have these conversations because I really want the energy to come back into these things. And I think people would get so much more out of it. Um, And again, when I'm playing with somebody, I am playing so far away from the line of consent. I'm not going anywhere close to it. And I'm going to do, if it's somebody I'm probably never going to play with again, or I'm going to, you know, we're going to do one thing. Um, I'm going to stay real far away. If it's somebody that I think is going to be some kind of play partner, some kind of, then I'm going to push a little closer to that boundary. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to kind of, you know, we're going to have a little exit interview and we're going to talk about this. And then next, you know, Hey, if, if this is something that's going to continue and go on and on and on, then let's, let's keep it light and then have a conversation about it. And then we could step it up and then we can, you know. Now tell me what you're talking about, about like, it's sort of like watered down the community a little bit that like the the new people who are kind of getting into it for more of the aesthetic issues or something you said something you said you've kind of hinted at something a couple of times that like the the feeling of the community has changed uh-huh. well yeah what's going on with that so i again it, it for me it's all about energy exchange it's all about the dynamic and when I go, like we have a big event here, there's Shrine here, which they're now doing in Houston. There's a Temple of Flesh in San Antonio. And most of these things, you know, they have these big 300, 600 people events. And I go to them and be social and I will never play at them because it's, I could pretty much tell you exactly what's going to happen, the scene. Yeah. And don't, people are are in those scenes are still getting a psychological thing. And I don't know what their dynamic is, but there's there's just no kind of palpable energy coming from it Mm -hmm. you know when somebody's getting flogged and it could be a machine flogging them or it could be i could is that what they have machines no but they could (laughs) oh i mean if if you're getting flogged and i'm just kind of sitting here doing this we got ai robots flogging us that's taking me out of it exactly i'm just gonna be i'm gonna put it on the saddest thing ever (laughs) like the idea of in the future people are just getting their (laughs) bdsm pinks off (laughs) from little robots i mean i've there's some, you know, fuck machines and things like that. Yeah, that fuck are, machines can be, you know, can just be like yeah, physically a good thing. But like the, the idea because of the the power exchange, the psychological dynamics, the idea of doing that with a robot is just so sad. <laughs> but I've I've seen a lot of things that happen that and it, you can't put what I'm seeing and say that's actually what's going on in their brain. But, you know, the rope thing is what really bothers me is because it's just all about aesthetics and they're not they don't even do anything when they tie somebody up um i love bondage and it's all about bondage but you know for me i'm going to tie them up and then i'm going to do things to them and whether it's sexual whether it's kind of some sort of uh you know sadist masochistic whatever it is you know, there's going to be more to it than the scene. It's not just about me tying so you, you up. you think there's, there's a whole influx of people who really aren't into or just don't really understand or know much about the psychological dynamics of good BDSM, but yeah. are just kind of like in the community because just they just kind of like it for aesthetic reasons. Yeah, and social media, an internet has, yeah. has made it blow up and it's made it more accessible and more, you know, less taboo it's, for it's society. It's kind of, and do you feel like, do you feel like there used to be more of a solidarity between BDSM people that's been watered down because of this? Yeah, I think it's, I, I liked it when it was a little taboo kind of back room. This is reminding me of like being gay. Yeah, same thing. Do you thing. know what I mean? It's like, like yeah, now you can come out be... and be accepted. This sucks. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I don't want to be accepted. I liked my little. It used to be pretty punk rock or yeah. if you will to be gay. And, and it was, it's not just that it was like bad and wrong and a little underground. That's part of it. It is cool. But also, um, there's like a there's a real solidarity to people who are having like these shared experiences and um and and the gay culture used to not be like PC really at all. Right. We were not, you know, it was like we could because we were in the safe space of other gay people, then you really could make all the, the all yeah. the jokes. Wait. You know, and drag queens especially were just very like let we're making all of the sexual and yep. gender jokes and, and everything. Same thing. I, I used to, I have a very dark sense of humor and I love to push boundaries and say shit that yeah is you know will get me canceled if I say it here. Yeah. <laughs> As opposed to my small group of friends who understand my sense of humor, but 
I used to say, you know, in, in the BDSM community, in the, the gay community, especially the leather community coming out of like the 70s and 80s, yeah. really were a huge merge, yeah. right? A lot of the kind of the leather stuff that came out of the, the gay community was taken by the BDSM community. So, yeah. and there's still the leather community, which is kind of BDSM. But I used to say, you know, when Fet Life first came out and mm -hmm. it was, nobody really knew about it. And it was really just people that were in BDSM. Now it's everything. It's kind of life, you know, all lifestyles and whatever. Um, but I used to say, man, I could post, I could be 50 miles outside of Austin and have a flat tire and post on Fet Life and be like, I got a flat tire, I'm here. And they'll be like, my cousin lives out there. I'm gonna get him to come. Get like yeah. it was such a cu close community. Yeah. And we policed it very well. Were, so if somebody was. Yeah, like, you were strongly bonded together. Yeah. And I think there is something about being um, somewhat a little underground and a little bit, you know, like taboo mm -hmm. and everything where you really do kind of have a real bond together, which that is something that's sad to me about you know, the complete revolution of like gay is not just legal, but, um, you know, so this accepted. weirdly celebrated thing that people, and, mm -hmm. and, and it is like there are these people who are opting into it, who are vaguely bi. I mean, mm -hmm. all women are bi anyway, but like women who only date men or penis people or whatever, but they're queer and you can just say queer and no one can ask questions about any. And it's kind of like, well, with all these kind of like vaguely queer people and all of the acceptance, like it doesn't have that sense. Like I really feel like there's a change, you know, maybe. 11 ish years ago, I would say some 12, 2012. I really feel like there was a kind of real change where, like, when I would see other gays and lesbians, we used to kind of head nod, we yeah. used to kind of give each other it's discounts. The motorcycle. So, you know, I used yeah. to have a Harley. Yeah. And anybody on a Harley you pass, man, it was like this little, you know, little wave community. you do as you're driving. You're like, yeah. And, and yeah, and it was the same thing. It's, you know, people in Jeeps do it now and they have this, like, this little language and right. they kind of look out for each other just because we both drive a Jeep. Right, it's, and it's just, but it creates some yeah. kind of community. And I think once, it's kind of like my thing about now, if 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 we let every other, if we let every letter in to mm -hmm. the LG, et cetera, whatever, and it's like, when you, if you have a plus in your, it doesn't mean anything anymore. No. If you don't exclude anyone, there's not, it doesn't mean anything to be included. Yeah. And I get the project of like getting everyone to realize that everyone is queer to some extent, but like there is something nice about having a kind of yeah. counterculture underground vibe to an actual community versus when all the people are just being queer for Instagram yeah. or same. being ropey and, for and Instagram. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the same thing. It's it's so acceptable nowadays that um it, again, you lose a lot of energy in within the BDSM community. Yeah, and losing energy is such a good way to put it. That's yeah, I always I, I to delusional state I say the word energy. It's it annoys me some of the times because sure. I use it so often. But you know, with in the gay community, yeah, you used to have this, oh, like big hug, big warm hug within the community. Everybody yeah. was like, oh, we're all on the same page. We all got this thing, this, you know. Yeah. And I could see that, like I say, with the BDSM, it's my whole family knows about it. My kids know about it. It's like, eh, no big deal. You're you're into this. Shit, you know? <laughs> <Your kids laughs> know that. That's funny. I, they don't know details. Like, yeah. like they're they're not gonna. I, they, <laughs> they could see this. Like, I wouldn't mind them seeing this. Yeah. But, okay. Um, as long as they don't know. Uh, I, I'm very cautious to not tell too many personal stories in these situations. Do you have some crazy stories that you could tell that you wouldn't want your kids to hear? Oh yeah. That we can, <laughs> can we can we say can we do those for the Substack? <laughs> can, yeah. can we put those on there? All right. Well then, let's uh, let's tease that. We're gonna get into the after hours portion. Not kids, not safe bed. for Chris's kids. <laughs> yeah. Well, kids, I guess if you really want to subscribe to the Substack, no. Which, your credit card, you'll, you How can figure it out. Them? But uh, <laughs> yeah, might have, maybe there's a way to do that. But um, all right, well, Chris, is there anything that you'd like to plug or endorse or recommend? Not really. I just. Uh, it doesn't have to be of your own. It could be a book you read. Um, no, I again, I I like I'm I'm doing this and other things like it. I'm really would love to bring that back to the. To the Austin community mainly. Of course, it'd be great if it was everywhere. But I just think, well, this I think this will start some conversations within the friend groups. That yeah. Hopefully, it'll be a domino effect. And you know. thanks for making it to the end of the episode. Things got really juicy from here. If you want to watch it, go to politicallynb.substack.com, where you can find all kinds of bonus material.